First day of April 2019, allegedly, according to that thing we call a calendar. And this indeed is the Ocelli Effect, broadcast live from the facilities of Ocelli.com, but also heard in a variety of other places. We do welcome you no matter how you're coming to us on this particular moon day. And yeah, April Fool's Day, I know. But something that is not going to make you a fool, something that is not about April, something that isn't even necessarily about the calendar, but wait a minute, he might educate you about it. Jordan Maxwell is with me tonight, as he has been, for 20 episodes of the uh, series on religion. Now, there's a lot of things that we've covered, for sure, and we're going to get into it deep tonight, I assure you. But before we do, remember that you can always continue your education by going over to jordanmaxwellshow.com. Now, why do you have to go to jordanmaxwellshow.com? Because... That's the only website that's actually Jordan Maxwell's. That is the only website to go and get in contact with Jordan Maxwell, to make a donation to Jordan Maxwell, to actually deal with him directly, to, oh, wait, join the Research Society, which you can do for a one-time fee, and get really deep into this topic as well as many others over at Jordan Maxwell Show dot com. you got to put all three words together, though, Jordan Maxwell Show and then dot com in order to find all this it will be included in the show notes as well as a few other links but without any further ado let's let's get to jordan maxwell so we can begin the education for this week anyway and this month and jordan how you doing <laughs> just fine chuck so happy to be with you again can't believe it we're doing what number 20 now or 19 or whatever it is uh, we've got we've, we've covered a lot of territory but in theology and religion there's a lot more to be covered right and i thought maybe we would talk a little bit about a subject that i know a lot about and i was involved in that one time and that is jehovah's witnesses Mm. Uh, that's an incredible subject, and it's a really scary subject if you think about it. And if you've been in Jehovah's Witnesses or are or, or one, you know how scary this subject can really be. And it's it's affecting families all over the world. And so many people are just not prepared to know and deal with the truth. And uh, and it's really an extraordinary story of how Jehovah's Witnesses happen to come about and what they're doing now and where they're going as an organization and as a people. And I feel that there's something very, very frightening on the horizon coming for Jehovah's Witnesses. And that's why I'd like to talk about a little bit tonight. Because I feel Jehovah's Witnesses are, as an organization and as a people, are a fine people. I have no problem with the people. But the governing, the governing people the, and the individual congregations, the older men of the congregation, they refer to them as elders, the elders of Jehovah's Witnesses, I've been all through Jehovah's Witnesses. I know all about them, and I know many things about them that most people will never know. And especially Jehovah's Witnesses and the elders will never be told. Mm -hmm. I've been involved with them for some time, a long time ago. Well, let me let me ask you right there, because you, you said you've been involved with them. Somebody listening to this might say, what, was Jordan a Jehovah's Witness or was he yes. just, ah, okay. So you were yes, actually a Jehovah's was. Witness at one time. Yeah, at one time, a long time ago when I was younger, yes. And uh, at 19, 20, and 21, 22 years old, young, young just a young man, I was searching for truth, and I thought they had it, and uh, they were always very kind and very courteous, and I liked the people, and so I kind of hung out with them, and then eventually I joined them. And uh, I had quite an experience when I began to wake up and find out who Jehovah's Witnesses really were. It really, it really affected me deeply, as it does everyone. All the, all the different witnesses who wake up and find out that Jehovah's Witnesses are not who they say they are. They don't have what they say they have, and they have been misled 
on an incredible level. And so I found out a lot about Jehovah's Witnesses as an organization, as a people. And I am amazed at how far gone the Jehovah's Witness organization really is. And so I could talk a little bit about my personal experiences with them and the things which I found out. Today, there are, today, Jehovah's Witnesses are, in my opinion, falling apart at the seams. They are actually in a self-destruct mode. From what I can tell, Jehovah's Witnesses are falling apart. And the main reason why is because it was never true to start with. The things they were being taught were never true to begin with and ultimately if you're building a house on sand and you're not building your life on a foundation that's that's credible and provable you're going to one day wake up and find out you've lived your whole life in a lie in something which is just not true Hmm. it may sound good it may be something wonderful that humans would like, but in point of fact, the teachings of Jehovah's Witnesses are not true at all. And they have been misled and deceived. And therefore, I feel that now the organization is going to begin to show itself for what it really is, a secret society of Freemasons, who have founded the Order of Jehovah's Witnesses. And it's being operated out of London. It's being connected to Jehovah's Witnesses, are connected to MI5 and MI6, British Secret Service. It is a religio-political movement on the world stage. It's an extraordinary story of betrayal and how they have misguided so many people into believing things which are not true and I can sit and tell you for for an hour or so I can tell you all the experiences that I have had with Jehovah's Witnesses and I really believe it's a strange and frightening story but I really believe that the organization of Jehovah's Witnesses are is going to collapse soon And when it does, it's going to cause a horrible repercussions sociologically for the people who are members of Jehovah's Witnesses. They're not going to believe. They're not going to believe the tragedy which is coming. Because when the organization finally falls apart and the people finally begin to see what has been there all along has not been true, has been dreamt up by Masonic orders out of London, and when you begin to see the political connections and how the organization is falling apart, and mainly due to the fact that the reason why I think the Jehovah's Witnesses are going to fall apart and collapse around the world is because of their prophecies. They have been prophesying the end of the world, the end of uh, the end of the time of the last days, the end times, and the end of the system of things and all that kind of thing. They've been talking about the end that was coming, and that everyone should be prepared for the end of the world coming, never realizing that this was a secret society of Freemasons out of London. Well, who have Jordan. been concocted this story, have been concocting this story for hundreds of years. Right. And, what, what, yeah. What's interesting here, though, is I, I need to ask you a question because let's snap this into perspective. Uh, I always saw the Jehovah's Witnesses. I'm kind of amazed that you were a Jehovah's Witness at one time because it, it struck me immediately when I saw these people as a kid that uh, that this was like o- almost cult-like behavior already and uh, that they would come to your door and they would show you, you know, the Watchtower magazine and they'd say, look, the end of the world is coming, brother. Or don't you want to be prepared, you know? And yeah. I would say, okay, look, I, I understand. I would have discussions, quite honestly, with Jehovah's Witnesses on more than one occasion when I had time because I wanted to explore this. I would, let, let me see what somebody thinks who is, you know, really believing the end of the world is about to happen. Uh, I did not believe it so, but look, I could be mistaken. Let me see, right? Uh, so so I would have these conversations, but 
What was odd to me is that if you are being motivated to go out there and recruit like this and you have, you know, a ready-made little magazine and in some places, you know, they have stalls at flea markets and all kinds of stuff like that uh, where, where you know, it's almost like a shop except it's just the Jehovah's Witness shop. Uh, you know, things like that are around the country. And it's it's such an odd sort of thing. I, I, I said to myself, you know, it, it seems weird to me that – Jordan would get into this. And, and these people that I met when I would talk to them were some of the finest individuals, I'm very sure, in most ways, uh, who were good, honest people, like you said at the beginning, you know, uh, that there are good, decent people that were there and you were attracted to that. I can understand that part of it because they were. They were like, oh, no, we're good people. We do the right thing. You know, we believe in our taking care of our families. And it just all sounded very good and wholesome, except the end of the world is coming. This was the only yep, thing that was right. a little rough. And what's weird is I was born in 1972, so I probably became aware of Jehovah's Witnesses really psychologically in the 1980s. And but it was the same thing. I like I knew they had been there before that, but I knew what they were talking about in the 1980s. So let's just say it was 1982 when I became aware that what they were talking about was the end of the world and so on and so forth. And it made sense that every once in a while on a on a particular weekend day, usually there might be a knock at your door and we'd like to bring you the good news of Jesus. And are you prepared for the end of the world and things like that, they would say. Um, yeah. And and again, it seemed like they meant to do the right thing, but I found it odd that they would go knocking door to door looking to recruit at the same time. So it, it, it's kind of a, a weird conglomeration of things that come together here, number one. Number two, you know, before you're done talking about the Jehovah's Witnesses, I hope that you're going to explain to us why this is even... A, a, a useful thing to the secret societies, please. But continue on. I just wanted to note that though, that, you know, most of us have these interactions and we've seen them. We've heard of them. We know who they are. You know, almost anybody does in any part of, well, the United States for sure. I don't know. Do they do this in every country or, you know, I'm not sure, but I know in the United States, they absolutely do. So yeah. please, by all means continue. But I just wanted to make that note for the listener. It's like, yeah, these are the people we're talking about. And uh, certainly most of the people knocking at your door are not, you know, uh, the, the, the members of the secret society, I don't believe. I believe no, they're good people no, looking to do they're the good just thing. Regular yeah. people who have joined, who have been like me, impressed with the, uh, the attitude of, the, of Jehovah's Witnesses, impressed with their kindness and their courtesy. And, uh, and when you're 19 years old, like I was as a 19-year-old, I'm in a large city that I've never been in before. I come to California from a small city in Florida. I ended up in Los Angeles in 1959 as a 19-year-old boy. And I was living in North Hollywood working, and I had a little room. But the way I came into Jehovah's Witnesses was not like everybody else. I became very close friends with the with the neighbors next door to me. I was living in North Hollywood, and there was some really nice people, a nice lady in her, in her family, living next door, and they always had uh, uh, they always had barbecues in the backyard, and and they would always when they would see me, they would invite me over, and I would go over and sit and have lunch with them or dinner. And I enjoyed their company, and they and they always were very kind and courteous to me. And then one day, uh, one evening, uh, the lady asked me, she said, you know, why don't you come and live here at our place? Because, uh, you know, if you've got a room there, just come over here. I've got three or four bedrooms that are empty. You can come live here with us. And I was always over there having dinner with them in the evenings, and I was you know, always visiting with them, and they would do favors for me, and I'd run errands for them. And so it was kind of like a, they were kind of like a good friends that I could move in with. So as a 19-year-old kid, I did. And I and they were very kind and courteous, and I, I ended up going to work for her. So I, I could quit my, the job I had. I went to work for her. And she was always very busy in the motion picture community. So I was invited to be a driver for her. So I drove her car for her. 
because she was always busy doing things for the motion pictures. And so I was driving for her, and that was my job. And so I, mm-hmm. she was paying me, and I had a nice place to live in my own you know, my own room and my own bathroom, et cetera. And I, and I could drive around town for her. And so it was kind of like a fun thing to do. I had my own room. It didn't cost me anything. I stayed there and ate with them, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And I was driving her car to run around to the motion picture studios and meeting all kinds of impressive people. And so I just kind of eventually uh, you know, fell in with this family, and they were always very nice mm-hmm. to me. And they, and then I discovered that they were Jehovah's Witnesses, and I went with them to some of the meetings, and they uh, the other people there, they were very nice too. And so as a 19-year-old kid, I just kind of fell into being a Jehovah's Witness, and, well, after uh, and all, I they, they was were for the, quite a few years. Yeah, after all, they they were the stereotypical, and I, you know, this is not an insult in any way. They were the stereotypical, like if you looked up good Christian family, uh, I guess in the dictionary. I mean, you might find them. I mean, that's what yeah. it sounds like to me. It's like, listen, you're you're a stranger here, and we're we're going to take you in. And hey, how about if we give you something to do so you can earn a little bit, but also yeah. we're going to take that's care right. of you. And I mean, uh, th- 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 this sounds to me like you know, wow. I mean, it's just really what what else could you say? Like I said, uh, normally people would just say that's a good normal Christian family who you know seeks to take care of uh, those that may uh, be wayward in some way. Uh, maybe they helped out others in the community too, not just you, but uh, probably they were good, kind, decent people that were uh, generous with whatever it was they That's had. That's right. They were. Yeah. And, and I was accepted by that by that family. I was accepted by the whole family as uh, as a dear friend, and uh, and and I could help them out. I could help her out because she needed a driver to run errands for her, and she didn't have time to do her work and be driving too. And so it was kind of fun. I was able to drive for her, and that that put me in relation to all the motion picture studios, all the entertainment center in Hollywood. Everybody knew me because she was very important in the motion picture community, and she was uh, working continually, and I was running errands for her. And because Mm. of that, I was able to meet all kinds of major movie stars, and it was kind of like a, a real trip for me, you know, to be able to run into the big studios and talk with the major movie stars for her. And and making a few dollars every every week and uh, and and having free lunch and dinners and 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 dinners and breakfast with them, yeah. with the family and so I just kind of fell into, of uh, the family and so the family was always very very nice to me and very courteous, yeah. and you know, would always take care of me and so as a nineteen year old kid I loved it I love having a place that I knew. I was safe in, and I was doing something of value to help someone, right. and so I, you know, I just grew into going to the meetings with Jehovah's Witnesses, and that's how I got in. Hmm. You know, it, and so it does, I was it does very me happy one, uh, being in Jehovah's Witnesses at the beginning okay. because I, I, I liked all the ambience. I liked the the idea that the people around me were good and decent and and dependable and mm-hmm. honest, etc. <clears throat> like everybody else, I was I was taken in, but because of my in, in my curiosity, that I was inborn in me to begin to research and study everything, I began to very quickly start reading into the history of Jehovah's Witnesses, where they came from, and doing all the research on religion and theology. Right. And then eventually, when I got involved, I began to see what everybody else who has been an ex-Jehovah's Witness, I began to see little cracks of hypocrisy and double standards where the men who were leading the organization or the elders in the congregation were not very well informed. They weren't very well read. They didn't really know much about the history of 
uh, religions. They didn't know anything about the history of the ancient religions of the Middle East. They were not very well read about much of anything. They just were very important people. And whatever they said was the absolute law. And, and so I began to see and see things I didn't like. I don't like people who are going to be giving me orders and telling me what I can do and what I can't do. And they don't even have half the education that I do. They have no idea about the theology they're preaching. And then the more I began to suspect there was something wrong, I began to look deeper into the real foundations of where Jehovah's Witnesses came from. And boy, when I did that, I opened up a can of worms that just affected me terrible. It affected my whole life because I began to see who they really were and where they really come from and what they were actually doing as a cult. The people didn't know, but the elders, the men who were guiding the organization, they were guiding the organization as a corporation. They had a, a business. It was like a business to them, and they were protecting their position in the business, in the company, and they were protecting each other, and they, were, they had double standards, and they would lie, and they would cheat. And so I began to see that double standard, and that then the more I saw it, the more I knew I've got to find out more about this organization I'm involved in because I love the people I live with. They're very kind and courteous to me, and they've been very helpful. <clears throat> but on the other hand, they don't know what I know. They have been involved with Jehovah's Witnesses for so long. And me, I'm more a free-thinking individual that wants to know for myself. And so I started doing outside research. And I was living continually at USC and UCLA <clears throat> and the uh, Pasadena had a world-class uh, world theological library, enormous library, many, many floors of theology and religion. And I lived over there. I was always there reading and researching religion and theology and where things come from. <clears throat> but it wasn't until one day I happened to be, uh, I happened by chance to be up in Palmdale, California, which was about 50 miles north of Los Angeles, and I went up to see a publisher that I had been talking about, and he had some really interesting books about the ancient world and the cults and the secret societies and government Illuminati kind of stuff, and I was heavy into that. I got very heavily into the secret societies that run the world, and I saw an article that was published by uh, some place in Europe, and he had it. He had this published uh, this this map of all the occult religions of the world, and I I bought it from him, and in it it showed where the secret societies had formed themselves in Europe for the Nazi movement, for the Soviet communist movement, and all of the secret societies behind world religions, but, but you know, involved themselves in the founding of certain cults and religions in Europe that came to America. And behold, on that chart, it said Jehovah's Witnesses. And, and I looked at that, and it shocked me because I knew there was something going on in New York and why the organization was in Brooklyn, because I knew Brooklyn was a center for organized crime in America. Brooklyn has always been the center for mafia, for the five, for the five mob families. And, and I knew that Brooklyn was well known for being a center for crime and criminality in America. And why Brooklyn was in New York and why New York was called the Empire State and what connection did New York have with Rome and the Vatican. And, uh, and so the more I began to look at this whole secret society of Freemasonic, Freemasonic secret societies in Europe, especially England, 
that was organizing and directing the flow of the power of Jehovah's Witnesses around the world. And then it finally began to, uh, it finally began to, to become overwhelming and obvious to me that Jehovah's Witnesses were a secret society or run by a secret society, owned and controlled by a secret society out of London, a part of the British Empire. And and from there, I learned about an organization called the British Israel World Federation. The British Israel World Federation was a secret society promoting biblical understanding of how England and America was the were the uh, the progenitors of God's kingdom on the earth, and that one day God's kingdom would come on the earth, and we would all live in a wonderful paradise that would be controlled by secret societies of Freemasons, and they would be the they would be called the worthy ones, and that they founded an organization called Jehovah's Witnesses or International Bible Students back in 1861. And that uh, the more I started studying Jehovah's Witnesses and the more I began seeing their connection to this this worldwide organization, a Freemasonic organization called British Israel World Federation, and the connections with the pyramid and connections with all the measurements of the pyramid and the astrological implications of the times in which we're living, it all became very obvious to me over a period of about six months. The more I was studying the secret stuff, the more I began to see the Jehovah's Witnesses, the wonderful people. I have no problem with the people, but the organization was actually founded by a secret society of Freemasons, both in America and in England, in the MI5 and MI6 which is British Secret Service, were heavily involved in the prophecy writing and the prophecies that supposedly are happening through the Bible. All of this stuff is being manipulated by a religio-political secret societies of Freemasonry, period. And the way that finally dawned on me that well, this is what I'm involved in, I began to quietly you know, shut myself off. And eventually I was finally kicked out. I was summarily just relieved of my position and told, we don't want you around here anymore. I was told I went to New York and I actually visited in New York with the governing body because I was so zealous that I knew so many people in New York and the governing body headquarters. They invited me to go there, and I went to New York to visit with the governing body in New York City. And I, while I was there, they asked me. I sat and had breakfast, lunch, and dinner with the governing body, with the 12 men on the governing body. And I visited with them while I was there. And they asked me if I would like to come to New York and go to work for the Watchtown Bible Tract Society as a researcher because they were impressed with what I was doing and what I knew and what I was talking with them about. I didn't let them know that I knew who they were, but I was letting them know that I was well aware of the secret societies in operation in the Middle East and in what we call Israel today and Zionism and the, and the Masonic orders and where the money's coming from. And so I was asked by one of the members of the governing body, I met with a group of them in the library, and I sat with them, and they asked me, would you like to come to work here at Bethel and work for us and be in our research department and help uh, do the research for us? And so I realized that they were uh, you know, always exposing the false religions of this world, all the cults and the Catholic Church, etc., and so I was uh, totally in agreement with that. <clears throat> but I thought to myself, no, you better not. You better wait. You may not be getting yourself, you may be getting yourself into something you don't want. Mm. So I refused to go to work at Bethel. Bethel is the name of the headquarters. 
in, right, New, in York New York with Jehovah's Witnesses. Hey, Jordan, let me ask you something because the, the mainstream understanding of this, like, you know, the mainstream sort of history about the Jehovah's Witnesses is, uh, uh, in, in essence, that it was an Adventist thing. Yes, it came through the Bible study, but Charles Tace Russell would be the, uh, I think that's how you pronounce his name, would be the uh, uh, recognized founder of the church, basically. Um, yes. But does that mean that he was indeed a Mason, or does that mean that uh, it was uh, not really his writing? Or, I mean, how does he fit into that, and exactly wh- how does that come together? Well, the original, original writings were back in 1871. That's when the original first Watchtower Society magazine came out, and it was not called Christian's Watchtower or Jesus' Watchtower. It was called Zion's Watchtower, mm-hmm. and, the, and the emphasis was always from the 1871 to the 1930s, always the emphasis was on Zion. And in the very beginning, Charles Tess Russell was in business with another man, um, what was his name? He was the uh, founder of the Second Adventist or the Seventh Adventist, the Seventh Day Adventist movement. Uh, William L. Miller was his name. William Miller. William Miller was from England, and he was doing well in America promoting the Second Advent movement, uh, which later became known as the Seventh Day Adventist. And so Charles Tess Russell was his student and was listening to and going to the church that William L. Miller had in in Philadelphia. And uh, eventually, Charles Tess Russell began following William L. Miller and the Second Adventist Movement, which later becomes known as the Seventh-day Adventist. And, uh, And so eventually... Charles Tess Russell had money. He was he was rather wealthy. He was a very wealthy businessman at the time. So he had a falling out with the views of William L. Miller. He had different views about Jesus and about the way things were going to happen. So he started his own movement uh, and dropped out of the Second Adventist movement in Philadelphia. And this is why Philadelphia is called the city of brotherly love because it's not people loving each other, brotherly love. The reason why it's called, Philadelphia is called the city of brotherly love is because the brotherly comes from the Masonic order, the Masonic brothers. They were the brothers of the Masonic Lodge, and so they worked together. And so that's why the Bible says, you know, that it's a city of brotherly love. Brotherly meaning a Masonic brothers not the people. And so when I began to see the connection between the Masonic Order out of London, the the British Grand Lodge Masonic operation and the connections with the Zionist world movement financing Zionism and creating a whole new religion for the Jewish people called Zionism, and founding the State of Israel and setting up the First and Second World War. And I began to see the profoundness of this organization's connections to the secret societies of Freemasonry. It became very obvious to me after a while what I was finally involved in. And so I eventually left the organization and went on my own and lived by myself and started doing some really in-depth investigation of the Bible and religion and Freemasonry and secret societies and the occult orders behind world banking, behind world government. And the more I looked, the more I found. And it was an extraordinary world of opening my eyes to the world of secret societies. And that's what I've been working with ever since, all the way back to the late 1960. Mm -hmm. And so I really have come to understand that Jehovah's Witnesses, as a people, the regular people that normally go there, there's a lot of very nice people, very, very nice people. And they're very uh, polite and they're very concerned about each other and they're concerned to help 
and they're just good people, but they're being taken advantage of by very powerful secret societies that are misleading the people of this world. And the same powers behind the throne, so to speak, that's already behind Jehovah's Witnesses are the same powers, the same people, the same money behind the Mormon Church, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, the Second Adventist Movement, the Worldwide Church of God, the Christadelphians, and all the other, what we today call the York Rite cults in America. It's founded by members of the Masonic Order and the York Rite, which is a Christian rite of Freemasonry. And the York Rite cults, like I said, are the Mormon Church, the Seventh-day Adventists, Christadelphians, Worldwide Church of God, Herbert W. Armstrong, all of these are Masonic Order churches. And Jehovah's Witnesses were the most tightest, the tightest and well-financed around the world. But it's going to fall apart soon. All of these churches and all these cults are going to collapse soon. And when they do, there's going to be a tsunami of heartache and tragedy the world has never seen before. Because when you get millions of people believing in the coming God's kingdom of the earth and God's going to do this and God's going to do that and he's going to bring about a wonderful kingdom in which everyone will be happy. And when you find out that that's nothing more than a Masonic folklore based on secret societies and lies and deception and the very, the very foundations for all of these cults and societies is actually based on a secret societies out of Europe. And and eventually they're going to fall apart because they cannot continue. No lie can live forever. And Absolutely. eventually uh, people have been, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses have been talking about since the 1870s, talking about the end of the world, the end times, the last days and the end of the world when the whole world is going to be destroyed well, let me, and that let me was supposed to happen in 1889 yeah. and 1890, and then it was supposed to happen in 1914, and then it was supposed to, and then they came out with new revelations about, no, it's not going to be 1914, it's going to be 1929 or 25, or 1940-something is going to be the end of the world, right. and then they finally came out big. The Watchtower Society finally made a big, big to-do about the year 1975. That's when the whole world was going to end, in the fall of 1975. Mm -hmm. And so there was a big push to go out and get all the members you could, and the members should get rid of their property, sell their property, and donate money to the organization of Jehovah's Witnesses because you're not going to need your property after 1975. You're not going to need it in 1976 because it's not going to be here. Right. The end of the world is coming. Well, that was back in 75, and that was the big one. That's the big final conclusion to the whole world. Well, we're still here, and we're still talking about the end of the world, and Jehovah's Witnesses are finally beginning to catch on that something is wrong. Right. We've been We're, talking about the end of the world since the 1880s and, and 1975, and here we are at 2019. It's still here. The poor get poor. The rich get richer. The whole world is, is, is being orchestrated and run behind the scenes by secret societies. And so it's becoming well known, and finally people are beginning to see that there's something going on in New York with Jehovah's Witnesses. Who are they really? And well, what's really going on? Mm -hmm. And where is the money coming from? And who's right. financing it? Well, <clears> you know, <throat> what's really interesting here, Jordan, is is I want to point out a couple things real fast. If you have questions, we didn't even say this at the beginning, but if you have questions, you can enter them in the chat room, send them to me, or you can call in. Believe it or not, we have a call in line. I forgot to mention it. 319-527-5016. That is 319-527-5016. Now, you can call in and ask a question about what's going on, or you can 
Enter one in the live chat room at Ocelli.com. That's all fine and good. But what's interesting to me is where Jordan's talking about these different end of the world scenarios, right? All of them, you know, culminating in the big announcement in 1975. It's funny to me because, first of all, even during that foundational time period, uh, Russell was talking to other end of the world doomsday preachers, right? <laughs> and, That's right. Here, here's the funny thing, you know, you you were talking about the uh, that it was originally called, you know, Zion's Watchtower. I think it was was literally That's the right. title. Mm-hmm. Um, That's right. You know, how, how did that first mailing of Zion's Watchtower as a publication get made? He stole a mailing list, apparently, or got a stolen mailing list, I should say. That's what the evidence states uh, from another doomsday preacher whose uh, prophecy did not come true. Previously, who published a magazine sort of similar, uh, but it wasn't exactly the same thing. It had a different doctrine, you know, that was being created by Russell at the time, which, uh, you know, again, th- this is stuff that I discovered in, in research over the past, like, a couple of weeks, just taking a look at it, because to simply dismissively call uh, Jehovah's Witnesses a cult in and of itself, just leave it at that. Uh, it kind of is, but then again, there's a lot more to it, uh, where it seems like the powers that be are on one script. And again, the people, like you said, you know, a lot of good people, a lot of well-meaning and well-intentioned people have been sucked in. And uh, so I guess, you know, kind of fair and unfair simultaneously to call it a cult, because it's not necessarily mindless. I mean, even the activities and going around, and if you really believe that the end of the world is coming and that you need to save other people's souls because that's just the right thing to do. That's who's knocking on your doors. Uh, you know, so it's an interesting kind of parallel universe going on here where again, sort of like Joseph Smith from the Mormons, you, you got, uh, uh, I hate to say it, but another, you know, a con man loaded with religiosity, uh, you know, not necessarily religion, but re- religiosity, and there's a difference, right? <laughs> so, uh, but, but but again, the Mormon Church yeah. itself is well established today. The Mormon Church is well established as a Masonic order. It's a Freemasonic operation. The Freemasons mm-hmm. run out of London and out of England. With the Rothschild banking, the international banking cartels out of London are financing, organizing, and directing the work of the York Rite cults in America. Mm -hmm. And Jehovah's Witnesses are one, Seventh-day Adventists are another, Second Adventist Movement out of London, uh, Mormon Church, Worldwide Church of God, Herbert W. Armstrong. Uh, These are all York Rite Masonic cults. They are promoting something called Zionism, which has zero, nothing to do with Jewish at all, and it's out of New York, and New York is the empire state. And what are you talking about, empire state? God's kingdom. You're talking about the empire state being the uh, New York. Is Why? Because uh, when Rome, Rome, when Rome left Europe and the Caesars left Europe, and went into Britannia. They went across the waters into the islands of the of the uh, U- UK. Caesar set up the Roman government in the U- in the UK. And where did he set up his government? It was in a city called York, England. And so York, England was actually in England. It was a center for Roman Catholicism in in England. And those wars were being fought over that. The Protestants were irate that the Catholic Church would come over and plump itself, the Roman Empire would plump itself right in York, England, and begin to control the uh, the uh, United Kingdom. And so the Vatican was heavily involved with the control of England, and this is why it was the Roman Empire that was dominating the Europe and England. And then when... Uh, when the, this country was being founded, Rome came over here and poked their nose in over here, and they called it New England, New York. And New York became known as the Empire State. Yes, it's representing the Roman Empire and the New World Order. So that today when you hear Bush and all the other uh, Marxist, Leninist, Soviet communists and 
Nazis and all the other loons that are running around in Washington, D.C. today talking about the new world order. What they're talking about is a new world based on the Roman totalitarian dictatorship of a fascist new world order under which the papacy and Rome will dominate the entire life of the human race on the earth today. This is why it's called a new world order. It's on the back of the dollar bill. It's a very interesting and important symbol, which is telling you that Rome is taking over the world. Caesar always believed that he was going to ultimately control the entire globe of mankind, and that's what they're doing today. Hmm. The Holy Father is actually involved with setting up something called the New World Order. And this is why it's on the back of the dollar bill. <clears throat> and on the front of the dollar bill, it says, In God we trust. Who put that on there? The Vatican had that put on the dollar bill, not Americans. The Vatican insisted that, uh, that the, in 1951 or 52, the Vatican insisted that the president put that quote on the American dollar bill in God we trust because of the rise of world communism. They wanted to establish that we were the new Roman Empire and that the Holy Father who talks to God, he was our Godfather. And that's what the whole new world order is all about. And in order to put all of this together into a militaristic operation to make it happen, the, the, the 1500s, it was decided to start an organization to promote this new world order, absolute so totalitarian fascist world order in which the whole earth would bend its knee to the coming of a new power in the world, which is the Roman Empire coming back to life in right. America and New York, the Empire State. Right. And so, 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 so am I to understand it that... This prophecy for profit, basically, which is what goes on with these various cults, basically, that you're talking about that are controlled by the secret society. I mean, yeah, it, it does generate profit, so it has that as a purpose. But is it just uh, a, another sub-mechanism of the greater control grid? I mean, is it yes. just meant to keep the people in line, or is there another agenda here? Because, uh, obviously, uh, there, there, there are many different ways that you can keep the population busy, right? And uh, yeah. uh, certainly having them subdivided into all these different uh, different subcults and cults and, uh, you know, and, and different religions that are allegedly part of their culture, whether they were real or imagined uh, to their ancestors or not, are, uh, are, are definitely useful as weapons. You're right. Um, mm -hmm. Is is that really what it is though? It's about just establishing the the overall control grid, or is there a deeper significance to this? You think there's a esoteric element, like a, uh, uh, a requirement? There's definitely an esoteric element to the writings of the Bible and the prophecies, and that the and the and the prophecies that are being written that have been written in the Bible. <clears throat> that, that seem to be indicating something terrible is coming on the earth. Uh, <clears throat> I believe it is. Mm -hmm. I believe that there is a total totalitarian fascist world government that's coming on the earth that every human being, no matter where he is on the planet, will be under absolute total iron fist, iron heel of a boot so that there will be no longer any ideas or concepts of human freedom or liberty or justice, nothing. There will be one final government in the world in which the, the secret societies of Freemasonry will finally be uh, able to bring it together and get all mankind to agree to go along with it and go along. Why? Because it's already obviously God's kingdom. And you don't want to be against the Lord. So you want to go along with God's kingdom. And God, of course, is the almighty God of the Hebrews. Mm. That's the almighty God of the, of the whole universe is the Hebrew God, Yahweh, Jehovah. 
And so Israel is, of course, the only people on the earth that have an actual personal relationship with the almighty God. And if you can buy that, you can you just bought into the world revolutionary movement or what is called the Illuminati. Mm. This is a very, very big and old Masonic story going back for a thousand years, back to the Knights Templars in the eighth, ninth and tenth century AD. Right. And see, see, all but the of strategy... this is all part of what we're seeing today yeah. in the entertainment industry that's going right. on with Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark and and, uh, and National Treasure One, National Treasure Two and all this stuff going on talking about the Illuminati and secret societies on on uh, on television with uh what is it the uh Discovery Channel and right. National Geographic and all these other Masonic orders that are operating in our radio and television world that are promoting these ideas and they are making it happen. That's the best way to have prophecy is to be in a position to make it happen. So you write down what you want to happen, and then you make it happen with money and political power. You make the prophecies come true. Right. David Icke has been talking about that for a long time, how you, you present the power, you present the problem, then you present the solution. But they never never realize the same people who are presenting the solution are the ones who created the problem. Mm-hmm. And so <clears throat> that's what's going on today, that the secret society out of Europe and out of London is writing the whole script for what we call religion in America today. It's all being orchestrated out of MI5 and MI6 out of London, British secret service, British secret societies, political societies and religious political movements. And uh, it's really quite a story, and it takes many years to study it. And I've been looking at it for the past 50 years, and I'm well aware of how this stuff really works. Right, And it's an incredible story. Right, almost 60 years, which, by the way, if you go to jordanmaxwellshow.com, you can go a lot deeper if you go into the Research Society over there. I am a member. You can get to be a member over there for a one-time donation, basically, uh, to keep the efforts going. New material is being added constantly. Plus, in the public area, you can contact Jordan directly. It is the only website that is actually Jordan Maxwell's and the only website that I would send you to for Jordan Maxwell's material. JordanMaxwellShow.com, also a donate button and all that over there. Jordan could use a new computer, by the way, if someone is so inclined, uh, or you could possibly contribute to that just so you know. Hope you don't uh, feel bad that I bring that up, Jordan, but I think it's a good thing to do as we get ready to close out this hour. Uh, Also like Mm -hmm. to remind you guys that you can call in in the next hour as well. Um, <clears throat> once again, three one nine five two seven five zero one six. That is three one nine five two seven five zero one six. You can call in and continue to engage in this conversation or enter comments or questions into the live chat room at ocelli dot com, and we will certainly address them in the next hour. Though I need to ask you a little something about this kingdom of God. Because, you know, it seems to me that if there is a king and who should challenge it, well, what is a kingdom anyway? Maybe we'll have to get into that. And and also, let's not forget that Jordan was talking about how you could go to the movies and you could see the script that was already written by the individuals who write the script. Certainly you can. You can watch it on television. You can listen to it on popular culture radio any day of the week. But, um, you know, if you go to church on Sunday, and I don't just mean the Seventh-day Adventists, the Mormons, or whatever, if you go to any church on a Sunday, pretty much from the pulpit they tell you that to be a good Christian, you can never, ever speak a word against Israel, because to speak against Israel is to speak against God directly. And that's the Methodists who seem kind of chill. That's the Catholics. That's everybody Who seems to call themselves Christian in America? This is the report I get from the pulpits across the country that uh, every minister, when they get an opportunity, will tell you that you can't say anything about Israel at all. And that does mean that they're not just talking about the ancient Israel, which is allegedly referenced in the Bible, which we've covered on this show quite extensively. But 
the current modern state of Israel is also apparently beyond critique and reproach by you. You are literally speaking against God in order to speak against Israel, but maybe we'll have to get into exactly where the kingdom is and who the king is in the next hour with Jordan Maxwell here at Ocelli. That begins now here at Ocelli.com. Of course, we do need to uh, thank you for tuning in, and, uh, of course, we're going to do a little thank you show actually on Wednesday for everybody uh, over at Patreon and anybody else that decides to contribute uh, to Ocelli.com. I am getting new glasses. Finally, uh, tomorrow I'll be able to pick them up. <laughs> Those things cost some money. Uh, but uh, quite frankly, without a little bit of contributions from you guys, I would not be able to. They'd still be sitting there. Uh, and, and I probably wouldn't have even tried to order them. So, uh, I do want to let you guys know I really appreciate it. And, uh, every little bit counted and thank you. But, uh, I'm going to get into thanking people specifically on Wednesday because I've got to get right back to my Monday guest who I got to tell you, it's a great uh, privilege to have you on every single Monday, Jordan Maxwell. And the reason is we are doing the series on religion in case you're tuning in late. We're doing the series on religion, and it has continued for more than 40 hours now of work. But uh, just really, there's so much to get into. And you know how you get deeper into it? (laughs) By joining the Research Society at jordanmaxwellshow.com. Now, jordanmaxwellshow.com, all three words together, Jordan, Maxwell, and show. jordanmaxwellshow.com is the only website that is Jordan Maxwell's. First of all, many other places might be attempting to use his name or make money on him, but that's his website. That's it. JordanMaxwellShow.com. And you can, uh, hey, send an email to Jordan. Let him know what you think about this show, anything else he's ever done. He's always grateful to hear from people. Also, donations could be made. You could get yourself one of those streaming videos over there. There's a public area, all kinds of stuff, but... The Research Society is uh, something that I definitely look forward to looking at myself on occasion, especially when there's new stuff in there, which there is quite often. Uh, so, you know, great deep dives into this topic as well as government, the monetary system, secret societies, etc. All of that available in the Research Society. More <clears throat> new material being added all the time. And it all begins at JordanMaxwellShow.com. So. Now that I've done a plug again for the website, Jordan, <laughs> which I got to. I mean, look, I use your website. I, I go there myself. I've got to tell people to go there. Uh, and, and uh, of course, you, you I'm sure, grateful that I do as well. <laughs> but uh, the fact is we're, we're getting into this topic. And, you know, three listeners in a row while we were in break, I, I took note of their comments and questions. And three of them all wanted to know about the same thing. <laughs> Which I, I'm laughing, and I'll tell you why. It was a funny image. I saw it a few days ago. Uh, I, I think the Pope was at one of these appearances. You know, the Pope comes out, and the town goes wild, and they shut down a city in America, whatever. But people show up, and they want to see the Pope, and they want to touch him, and they want to be blessed by him, and they bring their their children who are ill and everything else. And, and a lot of people will line up for miles to get a chance, just a chance, that they might be able to go kiss the ring. Uh, it does sound a bit like an Al Pacino movie, doesn't it? Uh, but but the thing is, they, they show up to kiss the ring, and oddly enough, in this recent clip from the Pope, he's pulling his hand away uh, every time people are trying to kiss the ring. Now, the explanation from the Pope, you know, officially, was something about, you know, he was worried about, I don't know, diseases being spread around, which would be the first time I've ever heard of the Pope not letting somebody kiss a ring because he was worried about, you know, uh, some sort of, flu virus i don't know uh i've never heard of this before i've never seen it before i found it funny and apparently three separate listeners <laughs> also wanted to know what you thought of it and if you had seen it um but uh but i'm curious to hear what what you have to say about it maybe you can help us to understand what's really going on jordan well i when i first saw that i immediately knew in my mind because of the symbolism of kissing the Pope's ring in the church and when he pulled his hands away, kept pulling his hand away from people, I know what that's all about. He knows that he is not in point of fact 
the, the, the sitting pope today. He knows he's not the pope. And therefore, he has certain spiritual obligations that he must follow uh, impersonating a pope. And, and the one thing is you do not let people kiss your ring because kissing the ring is only for the godfather. It's only because of the Holy Father who talks to God, the Godfather. And that's why you kiss the ring of the Godfather. Well, he knows that he is not actually the Pope. He is merely filling in for the real Pope. And so, therefore, there must be some kind of a spiritual reason he's reacting the way he is. Not letting people kiss the ring is basically... He's following some sort of a uh, of a protocol where you do not allow the people to kiss your ring as the Pope of Rome when you know you're not the Pope. You've been put in there, you know, by 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 other means, by secret societies. And the mere fact that he is a very high degree uh, Mason and also a Jesuit. And as a Jesuit, he knows he's not the Pope of Rome. Mm. He's been put in there by the Jesuit order that's taken over the Vatican and are now seizing control of the Vatican and putting him in to control the Vatican for the Jesuit order. But he is privy to know that he is not actually the Pope that he's merely been put in there to control the Vatican okay. for the Jesuit order. And therefore, I suspect he, he, he feels that it is not right to let people kiss his ring representing the papacy and the Pope of Rome when in point of fact he is not the Pope of Rome. Well, Jordan, and he's barely, you know, and uh, so I think that's what's happening here. Well, a bit of confusion for me because... I've seen Pope Francis before do do this, but not pull his hand away. And I'm pretty sure this is the guy that we call Pope Francis ostensibly uh, in, in the in the images, in the video. Uh, yeah. I mean, did, did somebody recently tell him, hey, hey, you're you're doing the wrong thing, you think? Or I mean, is this I mean, just maybe you don't know, but maybe you do. Because, uh, uh, I mean, I'm I'm astounded by it that, 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 that this happened because it's just so strange. Um, but, uh, uh, so, so you're not saying at all that this like isn't Pope Francis, the guy that we've come to know as Pope Francis, but, uh, but indeed that he's not the legitimate Pope is what you're That's saying. That's right. That's what I'm saying. He's not the legitimate Pope. He is a Jesuit, what we would call a, uh, uh an agent of the Jesuit order. Mm -hmm. He has been put in there. Because of his position and because of his political connections and because of the secret societies behind the Jesuit order, want somebody who can run this operation for them and be and, and, and handle it like the Pope. But he knows he's been put there by the powers that be behind the throne. And he knows that he is not the papacy's head man. He's not the Pope. He has been put there by the powers behind the mm. Jesuit order, and who they are, you have no idea in the world. I have pictures of Pope John, I think his name was I guess, Pope John the Twenty Third, the the, the the fat little pope that's been around. I mean, he was here around I don't know thirty years ago or more, and I have a, a photograph of him on his knees, being knighted by the French Grand Orient Temple Masons in Paris. Mm -hmm. And it said that he could not be made Pope until he made peace with the powers that be behind the Vatican. Right. And it was the French Grand Orient Temple Masons. I could send you that picture. I've saved it, and it's a very impressive picture showing the man who later became Pope he was a cardinal at that time, and he was on his knees with his hands in a praying position before a whole group of men, all of them very highly polished men. They were all members of a secret society called the French Grand Orient Temple Masons, and they were blessing him to allow him to become pope. Mm. 
without their without their sponsorship, he would never become pope. And mm-hmm. the article even said it was interesting that uh, that Pope John the twenty third was on his knees on a, on a pillow on his knees before the Grand Master of the Masonic Order of Knights Templars in Paris. But that the, all of those members that he was on his knees before in front of, they were all actually atheists. They mm-hmm. were totally atheists, but they had the power, political, monetary power, to decide who will be pope and who won't. And right. so he had to go before this French Grand Orient Temple Masons and bow down on a, on a pillow and accept them to bless him, to allow him to become Pope. Then the next day he could be appointed as the Pope because the French Grand Orient Temple Masons, the powers behind the banking institutions of the world, the powers behind the Vatican, the secret societies that are financing that Roman organization, uh, have decided that he could be made Pope. And so he has to come in and bow down before them and receive their good blessings first. Right. So knowing that, I know that when when the Pope Francis removes his hand when people want to kiss his ring, it's because it has something to do with some kind of a secret uh, a ritual that you cannot allow people to kiss your ring if you are not in that position. Right. It has something to do with spiritual powers behind the scenes. And that's why he keeps pulling his hand back when people want to kiss his ring because he knows he is not the Pope. He merely is there representing the secret societies behind the Jesuit order that's taken over the Vatican. Mm. But See, he's not the Pope, and he knows that. So uh, that's my guess. That right. would be my guess. That's my opinion. I understand. Based on some 60 years of looking at the Vatican. Well, I understand. Uh, li- listening now, Daniel comments that uh, he's actually a figurehead for the black Pope who is not in Rome. Yep. Uh, you know, and uh, I, I guess that 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 sounds kind of cryptic to some people, but uh, but you understand what that comment is, don't you? Of course I do. Yeah, I, I know exactly what's going on with the Black Pope. He's probably one of the most important people in the world because he is the Vicar General of the Jesuit Order. The Vicar General is a military title given to a military man that's in a military order. And that military order is called Jesuits. <clears throat> exactly. And that's what the Pope is, is a Jesuit. He represents a secret society of very powerful military industrial complex of Europe. And he is therefore not really a Pope at all. But he's merely there representing the Vatican. And he's there representing the, the Jesuits in the Vatican. Mm. And so... Well, it's interesting think thinking about the hierarchy. Kind of a ritual. It's interesting thinking about the hierarchy because you know we often hear about the kingdom of heaven, and uh, you know the 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 kingdom, the kingdom, right? <laughs> yes. So, in order to have a kingdom, it usually means you have a king. But you know, it, it's it's kind of that's why I thought of hierarchy here. But the the idea that uh, the the kingdom as it is, right? I, I don't know. For me. I think of the animal kingdom when I hear the word kingdom. And uh, we, we, we often talk about, you know, again, the, the king of the jungle is the lion, you know, uh, stuff like this. And there there's a hierarchy in the uh, the food chain, if you will. The, uh, and the lion is also the symbol for Leo, the constellation, the, the zodiac constellation of Leo, right. Leo the lion. And so the whole idea of the kingdom of God has been totally, totally and completely misunderstood from day one. And I will tell you the correct understanding of the kingdom of God. Okay. <clears throat> kingdom of God comes from the idea that we humans on this earth, we have a tendency to place in particular family groups, different life forms. We say that birds are in flocks, uh, ants are in colonies, fish are in schools, cattle are in herds. 
You know, we have a we have a family name for all of the life on the earth. We put them into certain family groups. And so there is another murders. group that we humans put into a kingdom. It's called the animal kingdom. And so what was the animal in the ancient prehistoric, in the ancient Greek world, animal is connected to the word zoo. And this is where you have today, zoos have animals because zoo was a word used in relation to animals. And therefore, animals are in a kingdom. And they're in the zoo, which gives us that word zodiac or zodiac. Zodiac comes from the word zoo. Zoo comes a word from, from the ancient Greek word for animals. And so the zodiac is referred to as the house of animals. And so one of the zodiac symbols is Leo, Leo the lion, an animal. <clears throat> there are all different kinds of animals represented in the zodiac. And so to understand the kingdom of God is to understand that the zodiac is the kingdom of God because it is a kingdom of the animals. And so when it, when Jesus says, when you pray, we call it God, we call it the Lord's prayer. No, it's not the Lord's prayer. <clears throat> That's misunderstood. <clears throat> it's the prayer that the Lord told you to pray. It's not his prayer. He prayed another prayer. But the, the Lord told you, when you pray, you pray this way. You say, Our Father who art in heaven. Obviously, that's God. Hallowed be thy name. And then let thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom of animals, the zodiac. Let thy kingdom come. And let thy will be done on the earth. Well, that's what the Zodiac does. It exerts its will on the earth. And so we're told that let thy kingdom come and thy will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. So what you're saying is that we realize as Christians we realize that the different animals in the Zodiac dominate the Zodiac. And so every 2,150 years, a different zodiological sign appears at the eclipse, and the sun rises each 2,150-year period. The sun rises for 2,150 years on the, on the equator, and a particular set of stars is one of the 12 signs of the Zodiac. And so when the, when the sun was rising in a set of stars thousands of years ago called Taurus the Bull. Taurus the Bull, <clears throat> well, he was, uh, he, uh, God was being worshipped thousands of years ago in India under the name of Taurus, the constellation of Taurus the Bull. And it was when the sun was in the constellation of Taurus. So the sun is golden and the bull is a calf. So the uh, so therefore the ancient people of India were worshiping a golden calf. The Jews were worshiping a golden calf. Yeah, golden is the sun, and the calf was Taurus. And then Moses comes into the picture later on, two thousand one hundred fifty years later. Moses comes into the picture now in the scriptures, and he is called up onto the mountain, like Martin Luther King said, "I've been to the mountain top." Well, Moses goes to the mountaintop to talk to God. God calls him up, says, I got something to tell you. Come up here. And so Moses goes up into the mountain while the people of Israel are still down there worshiping God the way they always have for over 2,150 years. They're worshiping the golden calf, the sun in the age of Taurus the bull. And then God says, go down and tell these people that they've got a whole new dispensation a whole new religion, and it's coming from me. I am God, and I am telling you to tell the people that there's a new way that you need to worship me. So go down and tell them to stop worshiping me uh, as a son in the age of Taurus and tell them they're going to worship me for the next 2,150 years in the age of Aries, the ram. Mm -hmm. The next constellation 
is Aries the ram, and you tell the people to worship me in the age of Aries, the ram. Tell them to find a ram's horn and blow on the ram's horn, call the shofar, and so that and so the Israel. So Moses goes down and he sees the people dancing around worshiping the golden calf of Taurus, and he's telling them, "No, God said you've got a whole new religion." And it's going to be the worship of God in the age and the sun rising in the age of Tur- of Aries the ram. And so get a ram's horn, build a shofar, find a ram and cut the horn and blow on the horn. It's called the shofar, the ram's horn. Mm. Why? Because you are now worshiping God in the age of Aries the ram. And then 2,150 years later, the same amount of time for each sign of the Zodiac, 2,150 years later, places it in, in the, into the A.D. And the next constellation after the ram going backwards is, is Pisces, the two fish. And so now, supposedly, there's a new prophet comes on the scene that goes and talks to God, and he comes down to tell the world that God said, now we're going to have a new religion. It's going to be the religion of the two fish. And so everybody says, no, 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 no. We've been, we've been worshiping the almighty God with the worship, blowing the rams, the rams horn, the shofar. We've done that for over 2,000 years, and we're not about to change. And so Jesus comes along and says, no, we have a new religion. It's going to be the religion of Pisces, the two fish. So from here on out, start looking to present yourself to the world as a fish. And that's why Christians have the fish symbol on their car for the two fish of Pisces. And so now uh, coming at the end of the of the 2000 year period of the Piscean age, Pisces was the time when Christianity took over. Now we're coming to the, the end of the 2150 years of Pisces. And what are we going to do next? Well, that's why the Bible says the apostles came to Jesus when he was going to die for them. He was going to go and die. They knew it. So they came to him and they said, "Uh, great teacher, Messiah, now that you're going to die in the age of Pisces, the two fish, where are we going next? The 12 apostles represent the 12 signs of the zodiac. So the zodiological kingdom in the heavens that's having its effect on the earth, the zodiological kingdom asks God's Son, the light of the world, our risen Savior. Of course, the Son is the light of the world, and it is your risen Savior. If it doesn't come up, we're dead. And so, therefore, the kingdom in heaven is asking God's Son Where are we going to go next now that you're going to die in the age of Pisces? And he says, go into the city, and this is in the book of Luke 22.10. Go read it yourself. In the the New Testament book of Luke 22.10, Jesus tells the chosen 12, the 12 apostles, no, the 12 signs of the zodiac. He tells the the, the, the collection of the 12 signs go into the city in Luke 22 10 go into the city and you will see a man carrying a pitcher of water go into the house of the man with the pitcher of water well anybody who knows anything about astrology knows the next sign after Pisces the two fish is, a, is the uh, age of Aquarius And so Aquarius is symbolized by man carrying a pitcher of water. So what we're talking about is in the New Testament story of Jesus is actually the story of God's kingdom, the Masonic story going all the way back thousands of years ago about the different animals in God's kingdom. The animals are the 12 signs of the zodiac. The 12 signs of the zodiac has the, has it the definite effect on the earth? The whole world changes when a new kingdom comes into play, and we're getting ready. This is the end of the age of Pisces. It's not through yet. It's almost coming. It's almost getting ready to change into the age of 
of, uh, of uh, the water bearer. And anybody who has ever read or studied anything about theology knows men never, ever carried water in the, uh, in the Middle East. It was a never to be done. No man ever carried water, period. Mm. It was always women that were at the well, women at the well, not men. Men never went to the well. The wells were always for women to get the water, and they carried the water. So no man ever carried water. The Bible reference works and encyclopedias will tell you that there never was a time when a man would carry water because it was an insult to a male for him to carry water. Other men would mock him and laugh at him. That was a woman's job to carry water. Well, why does Jesus, God's Son, the light of the world, our risen Savior, why does the Son tell the 12 signs of the Zodiac, now that I'm going to die again, I've been dying every 2,150 years, now I'm going to die again, and the new sign you're going to go into, go into the city and you'll see a man carrying a pitcher of water. Go into the house of the man with the water pitcher. That's the house of Aquarius. And that's why you have Christian songs like, In My Father's House Are Many Mansions. That's a favorite song sung by Christians many, many years ago. In My Father's House Are Many Mansions. No, that's incorrect. That's not the way it's said. Correctly understood, you should say, In My Father's Abode, not My Father's House. Abode is where the father lives. That's his general area of life. is not in a house, but in his abode. And where is the father's abode if it's not in heaven? And so that song, the Christian saying, in my father's house are many mansions. No, correctly, go back and read it right. It's in my father's abode are many houses, not mansions. Mansions in biblical terms, if you get a biblical dictionary and look up mansions, it will tell you it's a house of the zodiac. It's called a mansion, the 12 major houses in heaven. And they're not just houses, they were mansions. The 12 signs of the zodiac are the mansions in the heavens. So therefore, in my father's abode, which is heaven, are many mansions. In my father's abode are many houses of the zodiac. So the bottom line, whether you like it or not, God's kingdom is the zodiac. And therefore, what you're doing as a Christian, you're saying to the heaven, you're talking to God and saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Let thy kingdom of animals in the zodiac, let thy kingdom of animals let thy kingdom come and let thy will be done. Well, it's going to be done. It's, it's going to be done, whether you like it or not. When the chariots moves into power, the Bible says in Revelation, there will be a new heaven and a new earth. That's right. When the chariots moves in, we're going to have a whole new heavens. And it's going to be dominated by Aquarius, not Pisces, not Taurus the bull, not Aries, no. We're going to have a whole new era, a whole new heavens, and it's going to cause a whole new earth. That's why the Bible says in Revelation, after the kingdom comes, there will be a new heavens and a new earth. The new heavens will be the heavens dominated by the house of Aquarius, and the, and the life of mankind will be under the Aquarian doctrines, the Aquarian understanding of astrology. So Aquarius is coming. It's not here yet. It's the dawning of the age of Aquarius, meaning the sun is just now, just about, just about ready to touch at the equator. They're just about ready now to touch the stars of the coming 2,150-year period called Aquarius. That's why the song says it's not the age of Aquarius. This is the dawning of the age of Aquarius. The sun hasn't risen yet on Aquarius. It's getting real close. We're over 2,019 years into 2,150. 
So we're getting real close to that 2,150 because we're 2,019 years into it already. So the lion's share has already passed. We're over 2,000 already. And that's the big bulk of it. So if we're past the 2,000, you better get ready because it's coming soon, the dawning of the age of Aquarius. And therefore, today, we have, of course, Jews who will tell you that's all a bunch of bull. We've always worshipped God blowing the ram's horn. No, you weren't always worshipping the Lord with the ram's horn. You were worshipping God with a golden calf. And the Christians will tell you that this idea of the coming of the age of Aquarius is a bunch of demonic lunacy. They have nothing to do with that. That's all devil worship. They have always worshipped Jesus as the two fish. They worship God, God's Son, the light of the world, as our risen Savior. Of course, the Son is your risen Savior. And, of course, the Son is the dawning. It's bringing a whole new world order that's coming, the age of Aquarius. Mm. And so this is what the age of Aquarius represents, God's kingdom the kingdom of the animals that is going to dominate the earth very soon. We're over 2,019 years into 2,150. So it's getting ready to show up pretty soon, but most likely you're not going to see it because it's still a ways off yet, but you're not going to see it yourself. <clears throat> but <clears throat> it will come, and one day, instead of seeing a man on the cross in the Catholic Church, you will see a man pouring a pitcher of water that's a prophecy that will come true. You will see a man carrying a pitcher of water, a pouring water on the churches all around the world when they finally wake up and see that it's time for a change. There's a new world order coming. And the new world order is going to be based on the age of Aquarius, the water bearer. And like in history, like the history of mankind, the Jews did not want to hear <clears throat> the Jews would not hear and did not want to hear Moses talking about a new religion of Ares blowing the ram's horn. They have, the, they have the golden calf, and they're not about to change. Well, they did change. And then coming with uh, from Christianity comes on the scene now, which is the age of Pisces, the two fish, and therefore the Jews say, oh, it's a bunch of bull. They want nothing to do with that Christianity right. stuff. Well, Christianity does dominate the world. Because, why? Because it's God's will. It's a divine instrument in the heavens. And, you know, we're told well, there'll be stars, there'll be, uh, um, what's the word? There'll be strange sights in the heavens. There'll be signs in the heavens, the Christians say. That's right. It's called zodiological signs. Mm. <clears throat> so the, uh, the bottom line at the end of the day is quite simply this. God's kingdom is the predominance of individual, 12 individual houses of the zodiac dominating the earth and the heavens of the earth for 2,150 years. This is, has always been God's kingdom, and it will always be God's kingdom. And we humans are always a bunch of babies. We don't want to face the truth. We don't want to accept the fact that we have no control. Right. <clears throat> and that God is in control and that this age of Aquarius is coming whether you like it or not. And you will change. You will see the world beginning to change and dropping the whole idea of Christianity as uh, of, uh, of uh, Pisces, the two fish. Christianity is on its way out. There's a new religion coming. Like Revelation, the book of Revelation said, there'll be a new heavens and a new earth. And that new earth is going to dominate, be dominated by the age of Aquarius. So get ready, whether you're ready or not. You know, get your face set up for it because mm -hmm. it's going to happen whether you like it or not. And you will bow your knee to the new presence in the universe under the age of Aquarius. And on your mm -hmm. churches, which will be around, your churches and your religious institutions will be symbolized by a man carrying a pitcher of water. That's a prophecy, and you won't be here to see it, but you'll begin to see it coming. If you're really sharp and intellectually astute, you can see it coming. The age of Aquarius is dominating the planet today, right. and it's coming slowly but surely with the floods and the waters and the rains and the floods. 
the age of Aquarius and the man who's washing the world with water. He's carrying a pitcher of water. And that's why the God's son says, go into the house with the man with the water pitcher. That's mm-hmm. where I'm going to be going next. Well, and it's interesting so, because the, the okay. houses, uh, like, you know, like you said, it, the different houses, I mean, uh, uh, people use these sorts of terms when they're looking at astrology in general anyway. Of course, right now as we speak, we're in the time of uh, Aries during this time of the year. I only know that because uh, this is somewhere around the time of my birthday. So, <laughs> you know, right. I, I always had that, uh, uh, I had to throw that in there. But really quickly, Jordan, do you want to take uh, some phone calls? Because we've actually got a few people on the line. I have no idea what it is they would like to ask. Sure. But sure. Uh, okay. yeah, this is fine. uh Really interesting. But anyway, I'm going to uh, bring in the 219 area code. Uh, just give me a second here, and I'll unmute you so you can uh, be live on the air with Jordan Maxwell. First of all, uh, caller, who are you? Hey, this is Charles Ross again. Hey, oh, great Charles show, Ross. guys. Okay. Man, this is Dynamite. Hi, Mr. Jordan. Hello there. Uh, hi, Mr. Ocelli. Uh, hello, Mr. Ross. Listen, it's really good that you called, uh, Jordan. I don't know if you remember, but he was the first guy that ever called in uh, a couple of weeks ago there. And uh, I think it was a couple of weeks ago. And uh, he had a, some very interesting questions. So um, good to good to have you back, Charles. Uh, glad glad you're still, uh, you know, gaining something from the show and enjoying it. So with that, I'll let you talk to Jordan. Hey, Mr. Jordan, I, I, got, I actually got two questions. Well, the first question you 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 you, you kind of kind of answered already in hour one. Uh, basically, well, I was always thinking that the powers that be put uh, the Book of Revelation back into the Bible to mislead the human race to allow them to do what they what they want to do to us. Is that is that what you're saying? Well, first of all, the the original biblical canon of the of the Bible, the book of Revelation was not in the original Bible. It was later brought in, and when it was brought in later, the uh, early Christian fathers said, that, no, take it out. It has nothing to do with Christianity at all. They didn't like the idea of the book of Revelation. They told us that take it out. It has nothing to do with Christianity. Well, actually, in point of fact, it did have has to do with Christianity. It's the basis for Christianity is the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation it is a revelation waking you up to the fact that astrology is the basis for God's kingdom. The kingdom of God is the astrological symbol. That's why Jesus, as God's son, S-U-N, has 12 faithful followers, the 12 signs of the zodiac, which we call the 12 apostles or the 12 brothers of Joseph, the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 symbols uh, uh, symbols on the breastplate of the high priest. Everything in the Old and New Testament is based on 12. That's right, the 12 months of the year, the 12 apostles or the 12 signs of the zodiac. It's all astrology, period. The entire so the entire story of Christianity is the unfolding of the greatest story ever told. The greatest story ever told was the ancient world's knowledge and wisdom of the zodiac. And we are going to be forced beyond belief. We're going to be forced to understand it, whether you like it or not. You're going to be forced to accept the fact that that is God's kingdom, the zodiac, the twelve the chosen 12 followers of God's Son. And so okay, that's where so, we are today. <clears throat> so so are you saying that uh, most believers are mis- misunderstanding it? Because every time I talk to a believer, they're always saying that, okay, it's the reason why it's getting so bad, because it's in the, pro- it's in the prophecy of the revelations and and basically, I'm saying that the reason why they probably put it in back, uh, put it in the back of the Bible, is because they they want us to be docile to let us happen what they're doing. You know, I, I yeah. Well, it's a very big story about the back of the dollar bill and the symbol on the pyramid, and the pyramid is within a circle, and that circle that the pyramids on the back of the dollar bill there's a there's a uh, there is an Egyptian pyramid, but it's inside of a circle. And that circle is Stonehenge. It represents the 
the magic circle. And this is why there's a, there's a song in Christianity. Will the circle be? Will the circle be continued? The circle represents <laughs> the female. The circles. The circle represents the female, the woman. And this is why I've said before, when you go into any big stores or any big restaurants or hotels in North America, I don't know about the rest of the world, but in North America and Canada, if you go into uh, hotels or restaurants or whatever and go to the men's room, it's always a symbol of a triangle on the men's room and it's a symbol of a circle on the women's room. Most women and, and men going to restrooms don't even begin to notice it. It can sit right there in front of you and be a snake to bite you, and nobody sees it, nobody cares, nobody even thought about it. But there's a reason why there's a circle on the women's restroom and a, and a triangle or a pyramid on the men's restroom. There's a reason why, and it's very, very important for you to understand the connection between the circle and the triangle on men's restroom in relation to the Messiah, who's come to save the life of male and female. It's a very interesting story of the connection between Stonehenge in England, which represents a circle, and the Great Pyramid of Giza, which represents a triangle for the man. The triangle, is a we call it a pyramid. Pyra, P-Y-R-A, is pyra, not pyra, pyramid. P-Y-R-A is the way you spell it. Pyra is fire, like pyrotex and pyromaniac. Pyra is a, is a fire, and mid is the middle. Therefore, the pyramid on the, on, the, on the men's restroom is a fire in the middle. And that's true. The fire of sexual generation is in the middle of the human male body. It's in the middle of the body. Mm -hmm. The pyramid symbolizes male sexual arousal in the middle of his body. The pyramid, the fire in the middle. Come on, baby, light my fire. <laughs> Get it? And so, therefore, the pyramid represents male sexual production of life on the earth and and his partner has to be with the magic circle the female is the circle and the circle is the stone hinge in england represents the fire of the sun in the age of uh and and all the different ages it represents the sun the round the round symbol for the sun it's a very interesting story when you start to break down all the symbols of the world and their connections with the ancient Egyptians and the ancient Hindus and why the Hindus are still worshiping the holy cow. And we've still got the holy mackerel, which is the fish, and the holy cow in, in, in India. And as I said, wow. Judaism and Christianity are based directly upon the Hindu religion. Mm. Judaism and Christianity are Hindu, period. It, it is a curious thing about the book of Revelations, Jordan, because I, I have often thought watching certain things happen in the world, uh, quite frankly, that uh, it, it seems like the book of Revelations is not there as a prophecy, but uh, as a guidebook. Uh, yeah. You know, like as if, OK, how, how is it that you can become the greatest prophet of all time? Uh, if, if you're in control of things, you can tell people what you're going to do before you do it. Uh, That's so exactly right. So that works out perfectly. And it seems to me like there are people on this planet today that uh, <clears throat> want to see the great, you know, the interpretation of the Armageddon, if you will, that that thing that's supposed to begin at Megiddo and all of that which uh, people have been taught is the interpretation of what mm -hmm. is contained in the book of Revelation. Uh, and I think Charles was trying to allude to that, that it seems more like a, a plan as opposed to a prophecy. Is is that right. what you were getting at, Charles? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think, yeah, Ms. Shelley, that's what I was trying to say. I think they put it, put it back in there to give them permission to do the New World Order, because everybody's reading the, the Revelation, they said, oh, well, it's supposed to happen, so we're just going to let it happen. Mm. That's right. That's exactly right. It's a fail-safe method to protect the the agenda. It fails safe to fail to protect the agenda. If it's going to happen already, and it's God's going to do it, there's nothing you can do about it, so just sit back and just enjoy it, because there's nothing you can do about it. It's God's will. Mm -hmm. And you think, well, yeah, but that's only because the guys who wrote the book 
are now in charge of the prophecies and they can make it come true. They're using it, like wow. you said, as a play, as a play. They, they, they've already wrote it down and now they're going to follow the play. And so the whole world is a stage and each must play his part. And so we need a lot of people out in the audience to be playing their part of being frightened and scared because of the end of the world coming, the end of the world. And there is no end of the world. The word world is mistranslated in the King James Bible. Go back and read it, and you will find when you hear Jesus talking about the end of the world or the Bible, uh, Bible characters talking about the end of the world, the word world is incorrect. It is a misinterpretation of a Greek word called aeon, A-E-O-N, aeon. Mm -hmm. So if you go back to the Bible and read the, the uh, book of Matthew where Jesus said, go forth into the world, baptizing people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and I will be with you to the end of the world. No, that's incorrect. That doesn't say world. It says, I will be with you to the end of the aeon. A Greek word, wow. A-E-O-N. Aeon is a mistranslation world. Aeon is a word, ask any Greek who knows Greek. They will tell you, Aeon is an age. There's 12 of them. The 12 ages of the 12 signs of the zodiac. So it's a different age. So Jesus is saying... No, I will be with you to the end of the age. And this is why you have preachers today talking about the, this is the gospel age or the church age. They never even stop to think, what are you talking about? If you're a clergyman wow. in the church, you're talking about the, well, you know, this will happen in the church age, and then this is going to happen in the church age. And in the age of the of the prophets, is in the age of the prophets, and in the age of the church and my, th my thought is, what are you talking about? You're talking to hear yourself talk. Mm -hmm. You have no idea in the world what you're talking about. You're full of bull. You, know, you need to go back and, a and ask yourself, what are you talking about when you say end of the age or church age mm -hmm. or the gospel age? Yeah, it's a on that world. So we're looking for the end of the age. That's why Christianity today says, well, you know, we're, we're coming to the end of the time. We're coming into the end times. These are the last days, the last days, end times. What are you talking about the last days and end times? The end times of the aeon. We're coming to the end of the 2,150-year period called Pisces. Right. And so, therefore, we are in the end, of, we're in the end times. We are in the last days of Pisces. And so the, uh, the, the 12 apostles asked him, well, where are we going to go when you die? He said, go into the city and see the man with the house and the water pitcher. Go into the house of the man with the water pitcher. So what is, is being said in Luke 22, 10, it's an astronomical story based on astrology. My God, when are people going to wake up and understand for the first time Christianity is merely one more step in the long story, which is referred to as the greatest story ever told, mm -hmm. the domination of the Zodiac over the earth. The greatest story ever told is the chosen 12 of God's Son. This is why you have Jesus as one and add his 12. It makes 13. 13 is a perfect number for government. Yeah, perfect number for government and the Roman Empire was 13. Why? Because it's Jesus and his chosen 12 apostles. Mm -hmm. No, the son with his 12 astrological signs, the 12 houses of the Zodiac. Right. It's an incredible story of mistrust and misunderstanding and ignorance and ill-informed ignorance that the human race has fallen into because the churches don't want you to know that is just astrology. It's all there. Right. And and this procession. Go, go, go ahead, Charles. I, I know you had one more question. That's what I was going to interrupt with uh, to get yeah, to your question. That, 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 that brings me to my second question. And, and, and Mr. O'Chelly, you know, please join in. Um, my, my second question is, so my, it's about possession. So so does that my, it goes to my next question. Does, does exorcism really work? 
because I'm thinking that it's mainly mainly per person mainly it's in the person's mind that something's happening to them because okay uh, you know everybody's seen the, the movie The Exorcist you know a bad entity goes into a person's body and then all of a sudden. Uh, the priest comes and he reads the Bible and hocus pocus, uh, you know, the, the the spirit leaves. Yeah. But if, if 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 I'm going, if we're going on the the truth, is basically the Bible is just stories. How can you get rid of a bad entity out of somebody just by telling them a story? That would be just like me telling, uh, reading Spider Man to the bad entity and getting it out. I, I don't. That's what I'm I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand. Yeah, well, the, you have to appreciate the people who actually wrote the Old and the New Testament were very, very wise secret society members of occult and secret orders in Europe. And they wrote all kinds of strange stories because they knew what was coming. They know what the, what the powers that be are going to do. They were members of the secret society themselves who wrote the Bible. So they know what the ideas that are already floating around Europe and around the world, what the the powers that be behind the scenes were going to do and what they wanted to do. And so they wrote those prophecies into the Bible so that the people would be prepared for them. That's why you have Jehovah's Witnesses. They mm -hmm. were put into place, Jehovah's Witnesses were, to provide knowledge and to prepare the people for a coming Zionist new world order. That's why they were called Zion's Watchtower. And they keep talking about the coming new world order of Zion. So Jehovah's Witnesses were nothing more than a front for a secret society of Freemasons coming out of England and Europe. And this is the same people who gave you your Bible and gave you your sacred texts. Right. It's all been a master conspiracy for thousands of years, and most people do not have the wherewithal to wrap their mind around something so vast and so deep and so profoundly important. Most mm -hmm. people cannot even fathom such a thing happening. Well, in, in, I, in it's part, it's easy for me to fathom it because I understand it. Right, and in part, just because we're running short on time, Charles, let's let's never forget this too, that uh, you know what what is the uh, basic principle of the pseudoscience of psychology at this point? Right, is that right. Uh, re regardless of what the issue is with someone's mind, on occasion you're talking about people that simply have an issue with their mind, and uh, they they can build it on Spider Man or they can build it on biblical reference. Right. They can build it on the local legends and say that a local demon got into them. Uh, it, it is one of these things that happens. Now, in some cases, this may really be the truth. In other cases, it may be the devoutly held belief of the individual, in which case, what do you cure them with? Uh, you, you cure them with exactly the thing that infected them in the first place, effectively, right? Uh, right. You, you, you have to combat a psychological issue with psychology. Uh, again, it's not quite a science, but it does work. <laughs> you know, you, you, the talking <laughs> cure, what, what really does change in somebody's life when you're talking to them every day? Not much, except they got the ability to talk to somebody, right? So even psychotherapy, what they call it, and the talking cure and all that, uh, in reality, was any medicine actually administered? No, not at all. But somehow their condition changed. It's because it is initially a condition that they have conjured up themselves, for lack of a better term. So in some cases, exorcism will work just fine because it is it is part of the same thing. In other words, if they believe in the cure because they believe in the illness. What do you think of that, Jordan? Is that also? Yeah, I think so. And I would I would end the program by saying this: understand this one important point: the ancient Israel and the story in the Old Testament Bible and the Old Testament about the world of the ancient Israel never existed ever. There mm. was no ancient Israel. It was all written probably about the 8th, 9th, and 10th century A.D. by the Knights Templar Masonic Order out of the Vatican. Right. It has no basis in actual history. There was no King David. There was no King Solomon. There was no kings and queens and princes. There was no Bible prophets. None of that is true. There was no Moses. He never existed. 
We know that there was no King Solomon or King David because in the old language, going back to about the 8th or ninth century, you will find that everywhere in the Old Testament talking about King David, it doesn't say King David. It says King Druid. Druid, not David. Go mm. look on the, uh, go look up the word Druid, and you will see Druids called themselves Hebrews, and they had a religion they called Judaism, and they were Druids, not Jews. Druids, D R U I D, not D A V I D. So the Druidism is actually what we call today to call we call today. Judaism. Judaism mm -hmm. is a Druidic religion. It has nothing to do with Semitic because there was no Semitic kingdom. There was no Semitic people. Right. Semitic is nothing, uh, has nothing to do with the Jews at all. The whole idea of the Old Testament story of the new, of the, of ancient Israel and all the things that went along with the ancient Israel, ancient Israel never existed, period. There right. was no ancient Israel. End of sentence and period. Absolutely. And look, you know, again, you can go and study these things a lot more in depth at jordanmaxwellshow.com. That is the only website, which is Jordan Maxwell's. you got to put all three words together, jordanmaxwellshow.com, in order to get there. The Research Society, the much deeper dives into religion, as well as all of these other connected topics that Jordan has spent nearly 60 years uh, researching, speaking about, educating others about are all there at jordanmaxwellshow.com along with a uh, donate link, a, uh, a way to contact Jordan if you like, a public area on the website. All of that is there at jordanmaxwellshow.com. And I think the, the ultimate lesson to be taken away uh, from tonight's show is, you know, re regardless of the level of, well, truth, that is contained in someone's beliefs. Beliefs are rather powerful and they may indeed steer entire societies or individuals, whether they are well-meaning or otherwise, uh, to be manipulated by those who control what? The mythology. And that right. is the truth of it all. Jordan, do you disagree in any way? Nope, that's exactly right. What we are still doing today, the more we change, the more we stay the same. We are still buying into and believing the same old mythologies of the ancient Israel and God's chosen people, when in point of fact there was no ancient Israel or God's chosen people. It all can be traced back to India, to the Hindus. That's a fact, and so now you've heard the truth. That's a fact of matter is that Judaism and Christianity has come directly out of the Hindu religion. And that's why in, in India, they still have the holy cow. They still are uh, still venerating and holding holy Taurus the bull. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the Jews are now blowing the ram's horn. And then Christianity is now the, the two fish of Pisces. And now we're told about the coming of the age of Aquarius. It's all astrology from day one and it is time for the human race to wake up and understand the churches have misled you goodbye and good luck exactly that and of course we will continue this discussion next week with jordan maxwell hopefully because we have uh, continued this series of religion here a uh, series on religion of religion on religion <laughs> here on the show the Ocelli Effect and we do appreciate you for having tuned in tonight again jordanmaxwellshow.com <laughs>